And then I just made the comment. I said, yeah, we've got it on video. And they went, what? <laughs> You've got this on video? And they said, we'd like to see that. Oh, they used that and may still use it as a training film in Alaska mm -hmm. about how it's done perfectly right. We've all heard you should never bring a knife to a gunfight. But I know someone who says you should always bring a knife to a bear fight. <laughs> My guest today is Charles Allen, and he has brought a knife to a brown bear fight in Alaska. Charles is a master guide in Alaska, and he's had 28 years of experience in that wilderness and a close call with a charging bear. Why did you bring a knife to a bear fight? Well, I had the knife at the bear fight, but I also had a 411 KDF rifle with a 400 grain bullet, which was what saved my life. Really? It was quite an experience. It what, was, what happened? Uh, well, let me tell you what that happened. So it's in uh, mid-October on the Sayu River, Southeast Alaska, a horrible storm. We've got wind blowing at 35 or 40. We've got sleet and rain, and it's just a miserable day out mm. there. I've got a good client, hard hunter. My master and uh, my uh, assistant guide is with me uh, and had a cameraman. And uh, the hunter brought a cameraman. So we're out early in the morning, uh, hunting in the sand dune country off the Sayu River, and we find this nice uh, boar, nice boar brown bear and he makes a perfect shot guy makes a perfect shot on it um end of the deal i think and then here's what happened and it's more than a knife at a, at a bear fight at that point i'm watching the bear that just got shot mm -hmm. and my assistant guide said hey there's another one Ooh. and i'm going what and i turned and looked and off to the right coming from around behind a sand dune came a charging brown bear. And it was uh, intense. I've been through, as a guide in Alaska, I've been through several false charges. Mm -hmm. The bear comes at you stiff-legging, uh, popping their teeth, um, sometimes growling. But mostly they just kind of bluff charge you, get up close. I even had one just walk up within about 15 yards, and then turned around and walked off. And you're ready, but you don't, you know, it's not a full-blown charge. This was a full-blown charge. Oh, my. And it's unfortunate it was a sow. Oh. Sow had a cub. Oh. I think what happened, this 40-mile-an-hour wind, our scent was over here. That brown bear boar scent was out here where she smelled that. She did smell And that. she smelled the. Uh, you know, she smelled him, the boar, and heard the report of the rifle. Boom, boom. Okay. From my hunter. She came around looking for trouble. What's the problem? Saw us. And I knew instantly, man, this is a bad deal. And I turned to the guys and I said, you guys run. I wanted them out of my way. And then I stepped forward and I started waving my hands. And this normally works. Normally, if you start waving your hands at a, at a brown bear, he's looking at you, she's looking at you, a false charge, hey, brown, hey, bear, hey, bear, they usually stop, realize you're a human, and then they skedaddle. That's not what happened. I did, hey, bear, hey, bear, and that bear went right there. It didn't look at my assistant guide. It didn't look at my hunter. It looked right at me. Oh, my. And when it did, Ron, it was game on. So you actually drew its attention by trying to alert it that you're not I, a bear. I'm human. I'm you're human. A human. Yeah. I'm, I'm a human. I'm not a bear. And she took that as an offense. Well, I don't know how she took it, but she came full charge. Uh -huh. It wasn't a false charge. Uh -huh. She's coming on full board. How far away is she? She's about. She's out about, comes around that dune at about 100 yards, 110 yards. Mm -hmm. um, when she's coming at me, her, it like a dog. I mean, you remember everything like frame by frame. Yeah. It was like in slow motion. Huh. So I remember distinctly this bear coming at me, locked into me. Her tongue rolled out to the right like a dog you hanging. You remember that? Just like a dog going in, down a road in a pickup. Yeah. Okay. Tongue hangs out. <laughs> mouth is open. 
coming as fast as I've ever seen a bear run. Wow. Just right at me. And when she got about, and, and here's what goes through my mind. It's like, okay, should I shoot in front of her at 25 yards, but as fast as she's going, I then have, to, if that doesn't stop her, yeah, I have to work the bolt, oh come back, work it down, and she'll either be on me, or if I happen to not work the bolt correctly, I'm, def- I'm defenseless. Yeah. So I opted to go, maybe she'll turn. I don't think it's going to happen. I don't want to miss this shot. You just went for the one shot at the it's last It's going to be a one-shot deal. It's going to be a one-shot deal. And so I waited until she was 12 feet from me. Oh. And at 12 feet, I put it right between her legs, right in here. And that 400-grain bullet, not that knife. <laughs> not the <laughs> that knife. That 400-grain bullet went all the way through her and slammed her to the ground like he'd been hit with a, with a, with a truck. Wow. First bear I've ever had to take in all my years as a guide in Alaska. And I'll tell you what, you can still probably pick up that video somewhere, but it was an emotional deal for me. Oh, I, I I was upset that I had to shoot that bear. Oh, I, I was going to. That bear had a cub. I was uh, upset, but I'm not going to let that bear kill me. I'm not going to yeah, let that yeah. bear tear me all to pieces because I've had two friends of mine that have both been rolled up in that Sayu area where we hunt mm-hmm. by brown bears. They've both been mauled. Mm-hmm. And both of them went to the hospital, and I'm like, I'm I'm in self protection mode. Well, sure you are. I mean, what what else would you do? It'd be silly. Not so to. I shot her right there and hit her, and uh, then, um, you know, we skinned the bear, and uh, I went and got in the airplane. I called fishing game, mm-hmm. and I said, Hey, here's the situation. Yeah. Uh, talk with the uh, law enforcement people in Cordova, Alaska. I took the bear hide. Flew it in in my plane, uh, and when I got there, I said, "Hey, here, here's what happened," and they said, "Yeah, okay, that's that's uh, definitely a DLP, a defense of life and property mm-hmm. takedown, mm-hmm. which is absolutely legal in Alaska to protect yourself and your property." And then I just made the comment. I said, "Yeah, and we've got it on video," and they went, "What? <laughs> You've got this on video?" <laughs> I went, "Yeah, we had a cameraman there," and they said. We'd like to see that. They use that and may still use it as a training film in Alaska mm-hmm. about how it's done perfectly right. Oh. So nice the bear was coming. I tried to stop the bear yeah. with non-lethal force, mm-hmm. everything I knew how to do. Um, but when it got time, when it got time to act, then I had to pull the trigger. How close did she come to you? It was 12 feet. 12 feet. Yeah, we measured old? it. We measured it from where I was standing. Later, we we wanted to get everything documented, uh-huh. but we had the video. Uh, we took a tape measure out there, and here's my footprints where I'm standing. My rifle barrel is right here. Yep. And twelve feet from that rifle barrel is where her paws went like this. Um, when she was coming, I was saying that her her mouth was open, yeah. tongue hanging out, right, right. and when she got about, uh, I'm going to say. 10 yards out, and she's just smoking, okay? I mean, she covered the distance in five seconds. 100 yards? Five seconds. She was on me. Yeah. You know, they can outrun a quarter horse in the first 40 yards. Yeah. And um, when she got about 10 or 12 yards, 15 yards, I remember she just closed her mouth, and I think she was gulping air that whole time she was running at me. She was just Mm -hmm. gathering air and oxygen. And when she got she got ready to take me down, she just closed her mouth, and it and it was just as she launched herself, as she pushed off, you could see her front muscles just bunch up, and wow. she did that, and I'm like, okay, boom, mm. and that was it. <laughs> what was you mentioned an unusual rifle cartridge? The 411 KDF was a was a Wildcat. Okay. Um, and it uh, it has the ballistics of a 416 Rigby, exactly. What is the base case? What did they make it on? Was it a uh, a belted magnum, like a 375 it is, inch? It is. It is a belted magnum. And then they necked it up yes. to take a 416 bullet. It is a four. It's a 411. 411. Bullet. 411. Bullet. Yes. You have, do you remember what your velocity was? 
It was, uh, we had those bullets loaded at, um, I believe, around 2,700 feet per second. 400 grain bullet, 2,700. Yeah. Your foot pounds of energy in that bullet at the muzzle, what do you, do you know what that were? It's got to yeah. be over 4,000. Oh, yeah, it was over 4,000. Getting 4, pretty that. close to five, probably. Yeah, probably so. 4,500 yeah. anyway. Yeah. yeah. And that stopped that bear with one shot. You so often hear about shot after shot after shot. Did yeah. you hit the spine or anything, you know? Yeah, it just went in here, went all the way down the full length of the bear. And it was an eight and a half foot bear. Came out her right hip. Right. Uh, in the in the video, you see me work the bolt and you see the empty go through the mm -hmm. uh, by the lens. And then when I came up, if she if she was gonna struggle, but she she didn't. She yeah, just moved it all, huh? That was it. Did she yeah. slide at all? Did you get to see some slide? She went down like you'd hit her with a like a Mack truck. Right. I mean, it was instant mm -hmm. stop. That is cool. yeah, and you can see her feet in the sand, you can mm -hmm. see where they turned like that. So you see the you know, the, the, the paw prints coming straight forward, straight yep. forward, yep. straight forward, and then both 90 degrees to that. Wow. And at that 90 degree angle, that's where the bullet hit her, and it just down on the ground. Wow. And thank goodness. I mean, you know, it was, like I said, extremely unfortunate incident, one that I absolutely hated to pull the trigger, but I'm not going to let, a, I'm not gonna let a, a brown bear take me down or my client or yeah. – Anybody else? Yeah, it's I mean, your responsibility. It's, it's time to, to, it's time to act. Yeah, yeah, right. And you can't, uh, you have to have that all worked out in your mind. It's uh, it's not a time for indecision. You have mm -hmm. to have that already burned into your skull that if I get attacked, I'm going to kill that bear before it kills me. And, did, and that's what I did. Did you have any preconceptions about the distance at which you would wait until you shot a bear that ever attacked you like that? Had you ever thought, you know, I think I can let her get within 10 yards or 15 or tighter than that. You, where, at what point do you figure if I don't? <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, I've talked to several other guide, brown bear guides, and we've got a saying in Alaska. Uh, if you're a brown bear guide, it's kind of like riding a motorcycle. It's not a question of if, it's a question when. of when. Yeah. And that's the way it is with guiding multiple. And I've, you know, I've probably been on. 50 brown bear hunts. Mm. And, uh, I mean, it happens. And, it, and, and it's just one of the things that happens. So you had thought about when do I pull the trigger? How close do I let her get? 10 yards is the norm when people start having to take action. Mm -hmm. When a bear gets within 10 yards, generally um, guides will take them down. If, I, if I, I imagine as fast as she was going, if she covered 100 yards in five seconds, how long would it take her to cover 10 yards? Less than a second. It, it doesn't take long. <laughs> it doesn't take You've long. got to have nerves of steel to stand there and take that into well, that it, distance. It, after that happened, we had another incident about, about four years later to where we had another brown bear attack. Um, but by then, I had another assistant guide, and I trained him to do this. Um, his job was to shoot between the legs or in front of a bear if we have time. Uh -huh. Okay. So if, if we're in a situation, a brown bear is, is attacking us. His name is, is Austin. And, and I worked with Austin. I said, okay, here's the deal. You have a 375. Mm -hmm. I've got the 411. Your job is to turn the bear. Uh -huh. Okay. If the bear's coming, shoot in front of it. So I hopefully won't have to kill the bear. Yeah. yeah. And but my job is to kill the bear before it kills one of us. Did you have to go through that routine? I did ever? go through that routine, not just practice, but in and we were hunting up on the on the Saibat River one day. Um, had a client, a uh, female again, another sow comes down the river, and she's on the far side of the river. I've got two cubs, small cubs, on this side of the river, and we're in an alder thicket back up off the bank. Whoa. Two, two little cubs are coming this way. Sal's out there, and I saw it kind of beginning to develop, and I said, hey, we need to back out of this thicket. And when we backed out of that thicket, we were going to let those cubs just go on by, mm -hmm. and hopefully, hopefully the whole family would move on along. Mm -hmm. And uh, we backed out of that thicket. Well, when we backed out, there was nothing but marsh behind us, mm -hmm. a marsh grass. Mm -hmm. And so we became then not hidden by the alders. We became 
very, very visible to those cubs. Okay. So uh, we got about 30 yards off the bank of that river, and those cubs that were coming along, coming along, and I saw one of them look up at us, and I'm like, oh, boy. <laughs> and it, went, it stood up on its hind legs and went, Row! and that mama bear, that bear that I had to shoot that was charging never made a sound. This bear began roaring really? instantly, roaring at the top of its lungs. And my hair just went, <laughs> <laughs> and it was coming. And... I'd gone through the scenario with Austin, and I said, all right, here it comes. And she came from a little over 100 yards. Really? And she, when she got up on out of, the, out, of the, out of the bank of the river, and she's up there with us, he shot right in front of the bear. And I would say that bear was out 20 yards, 25 yards. He shoots a 375, boom, she just keeps coming. Whoa. Well, and I'm now I've got uh, this is a model 70 pre 64 Winchester K 411 KDF right. that I'm shooting, uh -huh. and I've got a three pound trigger. Okay? okay. And so she's coming, she's coming. So I'm down on her. And when she gets to be about seven yards, okay, I'm about a pound and a half <laughs> into a three pound trigger, <laughs> and I've got it right here. <laughs> and just before that gun goes off, she stiff legs. She went boop. And as soon as she did, I let off and she turned, went right around me, picked those cubs up, and was gone. Wow. And so boy. But that 375 bullet in front of her must have splashed up some mud and water and stuff. I, it was yeah, at that point it was sand. Okay. Um, but it didn't turn her didn't turn. then. But you know, got the concussion of a 375, got her standing there. Who knows why she decided to stop her cubs when she was coming that way. Her cub, The cubs would have been on her right. And it was a good thing that she stopped. I mean, she stiff-legged, went to yeah. the right, yeah. and never broke stride. She just picked those cubs up, and she was gone. Amazing. Yeah. And yeah. you had a client with you on that. That was the hunt. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. What did the client, yeah. well, how did he react? Uh, that was it for him. Really? No more bear hunting? No. <laughs> Well, I could understand it. Now, I want to get back to knives. I assumed when you told me there was a bear incident and we were talking about knives, there was going to be a knife fight. But why did you have a knife at the bear hunt? Well, my, uh, my main business is uh, I'm the founder of Knives of Alaska and Diamond Blade Knives. Yeah. And Knives of Alaska, we began, we have a 28-year history now. Really? Uh, yeah, we began. Knives of Alaska yeah, has been around that long? 28 years. Wow. And uh, this was the original, I'll show you the original knife that we started with. This was when I was a research biologist, and we were necropsying a lot of uh, white-tailed deer in yeah. my, on my research area. And I needed, a, I needed a not just a sharp knife, I needed a knife that I could take a deer apart when I was doing the necropsy work mm -hmm. and investigating the kidney fat, condition of the of the of the animal, whether it had liver flukes, uh, so on and so forth, taking the measurements. Um, and, and the knives that I had at that time, uh, which would have been in the, in the late 80s, just didn't have exactly what I wanted. I went to a knife maker and I said, hey, here's what I need. I need a cleaver. I want you to build me something that is thick. It's fairly heavy. I want a rounded nose on the front so I can skin with it, but I want to be able to essentially dissect this white-tailed deer and get to uh, the things I need to get to. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is what I came up with and had hunter after hunter say, hey, I would like to have one of those. And it's sort of like the, 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 the bell went off. Yeah. And eventually um, I started my own knife company. The reason I called it Knives of Alaska was because we had the fishing and hunting lodge in Alaska. We did all of our prototyping, all of our field testing in Alaska. And uh, a guy told me, he said, you know, you need to take that knife to the Atlanta Blade Show and enter it. And I'm like, well, okay. I took it up there. We won first place at the Atlanta Blade Show in 1994 
most innovative American design knife of the year. Wow, man. And uh, I'm pretty proud of that. And that's yeah. what launched, essentially, that's what launched Knives of Alaska. And at that point, um, we're doing all of our field testing in Alaska. We're doing all of our prototyping in Alaska with my guides. We take the products up there mm-hmm. and guys like you would take them and use them and, you know, real professionals. And, and I had great guides. I go, Hey, I want my clients. I want my guides to know what they really think about this product, mm-hmm. what they think about this prototype. So you and you field testing was going on constantly with oh, yeah. you and not just your idea of what oh, made yeah. a good knife, but your guides, your hunters. And- Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So, so we, how, yeah. how did Knives of Alaska, but you also have diamond blade knives. How- well, okay. All right. So uh, Knives of Alaska went along um, really until the year 2001. And our mission statement has always been finest quality outdoorsman's knives. So we were always looking for a better steel a better a better way to make a knife, a better way to make a better knife. And to me, the purpose of a knife is to cut. Yeah, they're they're pretty. They look nice, put a stag handle on them, uh, put mosaic pins in them and 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 dress them up. They look beautiful. A lot of people make a beautiful knife. What we wanted to be known for was the finest quality knives. So we started a project out in uh, Provo, Utah with a group of people, uh, some PhDs from BYU and uh, a couple of companies. And essentially, we we developed a process that we patented called friction forging, friction stir. It's from friction stir processing. From what? It's it's from, it, it originated, our process, our forging process originated from a process called friction stir processing. And what we're doing, we're using, it's an extreme forging process. You know, forging has always been known to develop a better product. Uh, Forging began with probably some guy with a rock beating on a piece of metal to refine the grain structure of the steel. So essentially what? Then it went to a hammer. So when you're pounding steel, when it's hot, you got the red, orange blade. you're, You're forging it. That's forging. And then it went to a trip hammer, kaboom, kaboom, kaboom. Again, a forging technique. And what we developed was a process of a rotating tool and real long name coming up here. And I apologize on this, (laughs) but PCBN is the acronym, but it's polycrystalline cubic boron nitride. And that's the second hardest material known to man besides a diamond. That's the kind of toughness that it takes to do this extreme forging process that we're doing on the diamond blade line. So it's a tool that comes down in a a big, massive mill under tons and tons and tons of pressure. The tool is rotating, and it takes the steel to transformation temperature, which is not molten, but it's plasticized. And when it gets to that point, <clears throat> the, the, the tool moves along what will eventually become the cutting edge of the knife. Hmm. Okay. Do you see that, see that real shiny zone right there, Ron? Yeah. Okay. Yep. If you can see that. But that shiny zone is the forge zone. Now, what does that do for us? Well, it refines the grain structure. It allows us to elevate hardness without elevating brittleness. Oh, that's, that's, the, that's the holy grail for a oh, knife maker absolutely. if you can do that. Because at that point, if you can get that rock well up into that 65 to 70 zone, mm-hmm. you've got an extremely, an extreme cutting edge as long as it's not brittle. And because we are refining the grain structure, making it super fine. In fact, it's so fine, you can't see it with a a regular microscope anymore. You have to go to a scanning electron microscope to even see the ferrite grain structures. Wow. Okay? Wow. So we elevate hardness without elevating brittleness. At that point, it's just a matter of physics. If it's that much harder, it's going to stay sharp that much longer. How much sharper? 
we proved with over 650 statistical tests that these knives, the diamond blade line, were at least 10 times sharper than any other knife out there, including my knives of Alaska. That's great information, but I know as a hunter, we always say, boy, that's a hard knife, but you can't sharpen it. It's too hard to sharpen. Let me tell you why these are easier to sharpen than a regular knife. Because we refine the grain structure so okay. fine, we can make this knife thinner because it's not brittle. So we can make the knife thinner at the edge. In fact, if, if you look at most knives, they're going to have a sharpening angle of 15 degrees is the absolute best you can probably see out there besides these knives. My knives are at Nine degrees. Nine degrees. Nine degrees. So we have a razor thin edge uh -huh. that's not brittle. Well, when the knife does begin to dull, you don't have to take very much metal off. Sure. Okay? Nine if degrees, if yeah. the angle is like this and it gets dull, you have to take more metal off to get that edge. All right. If it's like this, really, really thin, you just have a little bit of metal to move and you're right back to razor sharp. I hadn't thought of that. That makes that's sense. A deal. Yeah. Okay, that is cool. So I would imagine, though, that these are going to be fairly expensive knives compared to the ordinary steel. You've got to get that well, that's elaborate um, process. Isn't you it? know, we, we've done uh, six years of research uh, with Brigham Young University uh, and, other, and two other companies to develop this process. Uh, we went through the patent process. Uh, we make not just a very functional knife. We make a very beautiful knife as well, as you can see. Yeah. I and these knives, these knives are going to run from about 185 up to about 525. Mm -hmm. That's not, that's not out of the marketplace at all, especially because it's the sharpest knife in the world. Yeah. You mean real knife aficionados buy custom knives for a lot more than that. Oh, yeah. And they're oh. buying an artisan's one off. Product. There's a lot of knives out there that are a lot better looking than my knives. Uh -huh. Nobody is going to outcut us. Now, what, what, what proof, how do you prove that your knife cuts, more, it's more sharp or how does it, it last? Most of <clears> us are <throat> concerned about a blade that lasts. You're working on a deer, you're working on your second deer of the season, all of a sudden, doggone it, I got to sharpen my knife again. Yeah. Especially when I'm out hunting in the wilderness. I don't want to be carrying along sharpening tools if I don't have to. I want to minimize the weight. For sure. a sheep hunt, for example. Sure. I want a knife that I know is going to be able to take care of my sheep. And I happen to have two tags and maybe I get a caribou. I can do that caribou as well. Sure. I don't have to worry about it. Sure. Can these knives do that? Yes, they can. <laughs> well, that that's a that. simple answer. But yeah, yeah that's, it is. That's it, is. it. Well, I can see a professional, someone who really has to, like you were doing when you were knee crop seeing all these whitetails, you need a product that's going to work. You don't have time to mess around. But if a guy is just doing an occasional hunt and like one white tail and he goes home, he can sharpen his knives of Alaska, no problem, right? That's right. They sharpen pretty easily. Yeah. They just it's, don't last. Knives long. of Alaska is, is good quality. We use essentially three kinds of skills. We use D2, we use 440C, not A or B. Those are the less, they have less carbide in it than C. C mm -hmm. is an extremely good steel. And we use uh, CPM S30V. Um, CPM S30V is a particle metallurgy, uh, fine grained. And there we get back to that same description, fine grained, mm -hmm. fine grained. Mm -hmm. And that's what forging does. That's what particle metallurgy does. It helps make a finer grain steel, which allows you to get a finer edge on your blade and it lasts longer. But no one but Diamond Blade can use the friction forging process or duplicate what we can develop with that process. Yeah, it's just patent on it. So that's what you've protected with this yeah, friction protect forging patent. Mm -hmm. Okay. Wow. So um, how did you use your knife on, on your bear hunt? Well, you, um, you had a knife on your bear hunt. You took a knife on a bear hunt. You should always take a knife on I a bear did. hunt. I did. And, this, and these are the two knives that I always carry. I carry two knives in yeah. my pack yeah. and only two knives. And because, like you say, when you get out there, you got weight to consider. You've yep. got all the stuff that we carried, medical stuff, mm -hmm. knives, uh, et cetera, water, lunches, et cetera. So I have two knives. This knife, my caping knife, this is called the Pinnacle Two, which is also the counterpart uh, with, with the Knives of Alaska line of the Cub Bear. Yeah, I've seen okay? that. It's bear. an outstanding it's design. 
It's a great caping knife. This knife is made for your initial incision, okay? So I use this. I've got a 1,500-pound bull down. That's what I'm going to. I got a 10-foot brown bear down. This is what I'm going to for my first incision. In other words, that's the pattern. You, you go up or on a bull, you would come down the center of the spine all the way to the base of the antlers. Mm -hmm. You're going to cape that animal. Mm -hmm. um, this is what you make your initial incision with. And I'll tell you why I like this knife, because it is so thin. It is. And it's not very broad. I'm not going to develop much friction with this knife. As I insert it, I don't cut the hair like this. Mm -hmm. uh, turn it over, yeah. make, make my initial incision, go in, and then run it all the way up the backbone or up the, up the uh, ab abdomen yep. of a brown bear and then out the legs. But when I get that done, this is not a particularly good Skinning. Skinning knife. Yeah. It's not a good fleshing knife. It doesn't have enough of a drop point and a skinning belly or radius that we need. That's when I go to this knife because it's got a much longer cutting zone here for yeah. those important long strokes that you're making as you flesh that hide away from the meat. Sure. I also like this little guy. I've used several over the years, similar knives. This one is the petite one. Um, I've had some that are a little bit bigger than that, but uh -huh. the basic idea when I saw this, I went, that is the caping knife for just what you said, but also for working around the animals. Oh, it's, it's, it's excellent for that. Oh. And a taxidermist love them. Yeah. And exactly. we sell a ton of them. Anytime I'm caping out a deer or an elk or anything, I just jump with this knife yeah. right away. Yeah. Well, that's great. So you bring your knife to a bear hunt for the obvious reasons. <laughs> You're going to be skinning your bear, not killing it. All right. Hey, that was a great story. I want to thank you for that, Charles. You're welcome. And thanks for the information on those knives. I didn't understand why you had two lines of knives, a life of Alaska and this one, but that's new. To How old is that technology, that diamond blade? Okay. We started the research with Brigham Young University in 2002, and it was uh, a six-year research project. So when the first knives came out was? It, it came out in late 2007. Mm -hmm. That's when we brought the first knife out. It took us that long to develop the, the recipe, if you will, on how to do what we do. It's, it's complex. No. Um, the, the tools are difficult to make. The tools are expensive. Um, the loads, we, we, you can't test more than one thing at a time. So you would test. Okay, how many tons of pressure do we need to put down on this metal mm -hmm. to develop what we need to develop? Mm -hmm. And then, okay, uh, how many RPMs should the tool be spinning wow. to develop what we need? Really? And then how many inches per minute should the tool uh, move through the steel <laughs> to get us what we need. And I could go on and on, oh, but I'm not going to bore you enough. or especially <laughs> your audience. Yeah, that's enough, enough <laughs> detail. Hey, folks, if you want to learn more about Diamond Blade Knives or Knives of Alaska, I suppose you've got a website with a .com on the end of it. We do. Knivesofalaska.com, diamondbladeknives.com. you got all the information in there, all these details on how this diamond blade especially sure. is made. Absolutely. All right. It's all there. All right. Check that out. And the next time you're facing down a brown bear, see if you can't have somebody like this backing you up with a... <laughs> what, what I hope four? I never go through it again. KDF 411, <laughs> was that it? 411. 411, yeah. man. It's going to be uh, one of my new favorite cartridges, but first I'm going to have to see one. <laughs> yeah. Maybe we'll do a show on that sometime. All right. All right. Hey, thanks a lot, Charles. Hey, Great to have you Thank you, you on. for having me. Yeah. And if you need a good knife... You know where to go. Yeah, I think so, folks. Hey, thanks for tuning in. Let us know what you think about these knives topics. We don't cover them all that often. But gosh, you know, as hunters, outdoorsmen, we need good knives. And I think too, too seldom do we really dive into what's going to make the kind of knife that we don't have to keep replacing. A, a knife that's going to serve you well and be dependable and does not need to be sharpened all that often. I think most of us appreciate that. And it seems like these diamond blade knives really hold an edge. So until next time, this is Ron Spomer. An honest and shoot straight.